Okay, uh, I want to thank Jeff Berwick for inviting me here. And I want to show you our history, but much more important, what we term forbidden archaeology. This, uh, this is information and evidence that standard academics refuse to look at. And that's why it's important not to discuss things with academics, but to give it to you, the world, and have you decide. So, for example, this is Machu Picchu in Peru. And if you look at this picture, Machu Picchu was abandoned in 1535 by the Inca, and it was never restored. They left it intact. So when you look at this picture, you can see that the work on top is very crude, and the work below is megalithic. So that's a big difference in terms of construction. How could this be the work of one set of builders. Also, you notice the gaps in the large stones below. I was there with a, a geo, um, geologist, and she said that would be the result of an earthquake of 9 to 9.5. So if this earthquake had happened during Inca times, then clearly the stones on the top would have fallen down. So what I'm going to be discussing is an ancient series of cataclysmic events that happened destroying very advanced civilizations, and then the collapse of humanity, and it took 6,000 years before humanity could group back together again and create the civilizations we understand, such as Samaria, Egypt, and the Indus Valley. And again, the important work being done now is being done by independent researchers, not by academics. So here we have Stonehenge. And thanks to the work of many researchers, such as Maria Wheatley, who's here, she's studied Stonehenge for 35 years. And the standard uh, radiocarbon dating of Stonehenge is 4,500 years. But independent testing, multiple times, show that Stonehenge is 12,000 years old. And originally, it was a perfect pair of two circles. The outer stones were brought from a quarry 25 miles away, and the inner stones from 160 miles away. Then nearby, we have Avebury, where there are stones as large as 100 tons, and they were moved from a quarry three miles away. So looking more at this cataclysm, of course we all know of the, uh, the flood from the Bible, but there are more than 400 indigenous cultures that talk about a series of cataclysmic events that destroyed their world, whether that was an island or a continent or whatever, very much in the distant past. And thanks to scientific evidence, we're able to see that there was a series of cataclysmic events that happened likely from things that came from outside of our solar system, came into our solar system, and wreaked havoc. And also thanks to recent advances in technology, this of course is the mythical city of Atlantis. But thanks to modern uh, mapping and things like that, a lot of attention is being focused on this which is called the Rechat structure in Mauritania. And some um, academics think it's a collapsed volcano, which is unlikely. Others think it's an impact from a meteor, which is unlikely. And actually Josh, who was just up here, is going to be going and exploring this place in person. So you can see it's a series of rings with ridges, and that's exactly the way that Atlantis is described. It's been measured at 23 kilometers in diameter, which is supposedly the diameter of Atlantis. And it's located in Mauritania. And what Plato says is that it was beyond the pillars of Hercules, which is where Gibraltar is. And Gibraltar is just to the northeast of here. So that's just an interesting kind of um, 
development from recent times. But in October, they discovered an impact crater in Greenland where an asteroid a mile long struck the surface about 12,000 years ago. And this is the size of the impact crater that was, was created. It was made of nickel iron and it hit with a force of 47 million Hiroshima bombs. So that possibly could have destabilized the planet and that's what I'm going to be getting into. The big question is why is our planet at 23 and a half degrees? Why is it like this? In a perfect solar system, all the planets should be vertical. So something happened to our planet probably many times that altered the axis of the Earth. And this is some of the evidence. We have the megafauna of North America, of which there were 120 species, and they all died off, all millions of them, over the course of less than a thousand years. So that wasn't simply a climate change, it wasn't the destruction by native people, I think what happened is that this massive destructive event caused the axis of the Earth to shift very rapidly. And that's why hundreds of thousands of woolly mammoths have been found in Siberia with fresh buttercups in their mouths. They were eating food one minute, they were flash frozen the next minute. And so a number of uh, different theories cover this, work by Allen and Dallaire, who believe that a number of comets or comet fragments entered our atmosphere and struck the Earth and altered the axis. And they believe this happened about 12,000 years ago. And then following up on this is the work of Barbara Han Clough. And she believes as well that this happened 12,000 years ago and created an effect on what was left of humanity called catastrophobia. It was so devastating that it caused mental anguish for thousands of years. And she believes that the so-called caveman period is from 12,000 years ago to 6,000 years ago. That because of all of the devastating effects, those that survived had to find refuge somewhere underground and again 12,000 years ago. And then the work of Dr. Paul Laviolette with his superwave theory. And with this he believes that every 13,000 years the center of our galaxy emits energy that goes across the galactic plane. That includes radiation. And so he believes the last event of this sort happened 12,000 years ago and included this energy going straight through our sun and sending pulses of plasma towards our planet, causing the vaporization or rapid melting of much of the North Pole. And then the sea levels rose by 350 to 400 feet very rapidly. That is the ancient flood. And backing this up is the work of Dr. Robert Schock, who ag again believes that solar outbursts happened 12,000 years ago that melted the poles very rapidly, rapidly rising the sea level and destabilizing the planet. So not just the asteroid striking, but suddenly you have ice turned to water and that would cause the Earth to destabilize and then finally it would find a balance point. And from that, I was able to write my own book, Aftershock, about these devastating uh, uh, events that likely took place over the course of three or four hundred years. So the people are gone, the written records are gone, uh, and what we're left are stone constructions. So this is in Cusco, Peru, and you can see on the right hand side super tight fitting stonework of great precision. And then on the left hand side much cruder work, some stones being put back into place, and then when they ran out of that material, they had to find other stone to put in. And when we look at the first topographical map of the city of Cusco by the Spanish, you can see thin walls and thick walls. So that shows you around 1535 that this 
uh, map maker was distinguishing between the megalithic structures, which are the thick walls, and the thinner walls, which are the Inca repairs. And you can see none of the megalithic structures are intact, so Cusco was hit by a devastating series of cataclysms. And then also in Cusco, we have these polygonal structures. So what you're looking at is the early megalithic construction on the bottom, and then the Inca repair work above it. And at another location called Sacsayhuaman, which is above Cusco, this megalithic wall, you can see the Inca repair work on top. Some of the stones in this wall weigh 120 tons. And there are no trees, or there were no trees during Inca times that grew straight, so you had nothing to use as rollers. So how would they have moved those stones from the quarry? And during the last phase of the Inca before the Spanish conquest, this is an example of a royal palace of the Inca. So you can see it's made basically up of mud walls. This is Inca period construction. And then when we go to Saxe, or actually Oyente Tambo in the Sacred Valley of Peru, again, you have these megalithic stones, and then you have Inca repair work on top of it. And back to Machu Picchu, that beautifully curved wall in the background. Notice the two top layers of stone were put back into place crudely by the Inca. So the Inca found Machu Picchu, and then they rebuilt it and then notice the crude wall in front. And also at Machu Picchu, a three-sided structure. The right-hand side has sunk down by two feet. <clears throat> and again, I was there with a geologist. She said that is a nine to 9.5 earthquake. If it had hurt or damaged this wall this much, the rest of the city would have been devastated if all of this construction was done during Inca times. And this is a, loca a location called Saiwite. You notice that huge megalithic stone has been snapped in two pieces as if it was styrofoam. That's not a natural crack. And one of the most curious places on Earth is called Puma Punku. And the stone here was brought from two quarries one 45 miles away and the other eight miles away, and some of the stones at Pumapunku weigh 131 tons. And there has been some excavation done, but they've only gone down about two feet, again, standard academics. And when you ask them, why don't you, why don't you dig deeper, they say, because there's nothing there. But independent ground-penetrating radar has found that there are giant chambers underneath Pumapunku that the government doesn't want excavated. And as well, the large um, sun gate that weighs 11 tons, you see the, the crack in it? It in fact was snapped in two pieces. The Tiwanaku culture, famous for being in this location, found it lying face down, broken, raised it back up, and did the etching carving on the surface because at almost all the megalithic sites, you find no artwork whatsoever. It's solely form and function. And yet, of all of what you've seen so far, ac academics insist that these bronze tools were responsible for all the work. So let's move on to Egypt. So here in Egypt, the sarcophagus on the right-hand side is made of granite. You can see it's very crude in construction. Um, and then the one, this is where they make mistakes that I love. So the one on the left, they say is first dynasty, so it's older. It's made of one block of granite stone from 500 miles away. The lid and the box, or the lid and the box are one piece of stone. So somebody had the technology of being able to cut the top off that box, which you did not have that technology in dynastic Egypt. As well, hiding in a dark corner in the Cairo Museum is an unfinished box, 
and we can see the machine tool marks. Whoever was operating the saws, there were two of them, six feet in diameter, circular saws, cutting. The top saw started to cut into the box and snap the lid off. And then as well, we have vases, dishes, and other uh, receptacles made of porphyry, basalt, and diorite, which you can only shape with diamond tools. And so these are examples that they actually have on display. We don't know what fascinating artifacts they're hiding because they're too controversial. But you see, these were clearly made on a lathe, and they're listed as being archaic, which means pre-dynastic. So they're telling us that these were made prior to the invention of the potter's wheel. And if there were nine of them, that would be curious. But in fact, they found 30 to 40,000 of them in one location. That's a lot of work. And then the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is not a four-sided structure, it's 12 or eight-sided. And recently geologists have found out that none of the limestone that make up the Great Pyramid is from the Giza Plateau, it's all from Cairo. So that means that each one of the 2.5 million multi-ton blocks that make up the Great Pyramid had to somehow cross the Nile and that this was built in 25 years. That means each stone was cut, moved, and set into place every two minutes. Also, there's a whole system of shafts and tunnels. This is out of bounds on the Giza Plateau, but if you pay money to the local uh, guards, you get to see lots of stuff which is off limits. So I've been four levels under the Giza Plateau, and I've been told that there are another 10 levels that go down cut into the bedrock. And we, we find abundance examples of saw marks and also what's called the feed rate, which means the speed at which the saw was moving. So we had an engineer and the engineer said that the saw was penetrating this basalt stone at three millimeters per movement, which is 500 times more efficient than a modern diamond tool. And as well, the, the Great Sphinx, the face was obviously recarved during dynastic times because you see the amount of erosion on the neck is much more than the face. And now 200 geologists have told us that the vertical weathering on the Sphinx and the Sphinx enclosure were the result of precipitation. And when you do a climate model, you find out the last time there was heavy precipitation that could do this was 12,000 years ago. And then as well, they try to hide other evidence. So here you have this beautiful wooden walkway, but where the two man, uh, men are standing on the right-hand side between the paws is a rectangular uh, structure that can actually come out. And so I asked our guide, why is this in that shape and why can it be removed? He said, because that's the, that's the access to the tunnel and shaft system underneath the Sphinx. Then as well, we have this, which is called the Serapium at Saqqara. It's two underground tunnels. And in it, we find 25 boxes made of granite, each weighing 100 tons apiece, and the quarry is 500 miles away. And these two, the lid and the box would fit so perfectly together that they would basically uh, make a hermetical seal. So that's obviously very advanced technology. As well, the academics tell us that the hieroglyphics on the surface and the box were made by the same people. But you can clearly see that the dynastic Egyptians found the boxes in place and roughly etched in the hieroglyphics. And then now we're at the Osirion, which was purposefully built underground. These uh, granite columns weigh 40 to 60 tons. And then when we go to Karnak, we can see core drill holes. This one is about that big. And again, the penetration rate of the drill would be about three millimeters per revolution, 
which is beyond 21st century technology. And then going to the Colossi of Memnon. Again, I was there with a geologist. And you would think vandalism was the result of what happened to the front surface. But she said that the front surface had been hit by a temperature of no less than 2,000 degrees Celsius, like a pulse, as in a plasma ejection from the sun. Also, the base of the structure is one piece of stone. It weighs about 300 tons. And the sitting fig uh, figure is one piece of stone that weighs 720 tons and the quarry is 400 miles away. As well, in case you didn't know, the, this is the Valley of the Queens. We were able to travel underground uh, in the Valley of the uh, Queens for about an hour. And the Valley of the Queens and the Valley of the Kings are interconnected. So there's a whole tunnel system that goes underneath. The Dynastic Egyptians discovered these shafts and tunnels and use them for funeral purposes. They did not make them because some of, some of the shafts are more than 500 feet long and 15 feet wide and 15 feet high. And then we have the unfinished obelisk, 1,200 tons. How were they planning on getting that out of its pit? And also a place you may have never heard of called Tanis. The way you get to Tanis is you drive through the Nile Delta for two and a half hours through beautiful lush farmland. And when you get to Tanis, there are four plants growing. And when you walk the surface, it's like walking on the moon. It's like pulverized dusk. And what we found out is this is another location that was struck by some kind of massive heat force and it's evidenced by some of the statues that they found. If you see the background there, that's the original level. They had to dig down to find Tanis. So you can see that this sculpture, the right-hand side, has been burnt by heat. And then this one, the toes are melted. This is another example. This is a piece of quartzite. The kind of pinky color is normal, but the discoloration is from a burst of massive heat. And then finally, in Egypt, this has only been open to the public for two years. It costs $3,000 to rent it for two hours. But the great thing is that Egypt has been the, one of the most secretive countries in the world in terms of you're not allowed to see this, you're not allowed to see that. They actually decided to open this up to make money. So Egypt is opening up this way. So we, I said, I don't care what it costs. We paid our, our $3,000 and this is a, a glimpse of what you get to see. So you enter into the bedrock, then you go down a ladder 40 feet to the first level And then this is the fur, this is my wife going down the ladder. And then you enter this chamber, which is about 15 feet by 35 feet. Then you go, go down another ladder, 100 feet underground. And you get to uh, another big chamber that has two massive boxes in it. And then finally, you go down to the third level, which is another 60 feet. So you get to go down more than 200 feet under the Giza Plateau. So that's the great thing. The new uh, Minister of Supreme Antiquities is starting to open doors that have been rusted shut, open to the public, which thank God for that. And this is what you find at the very bottom. This is Yusuf Awian standing on a, a box. We're not sure how they got the box down the, the series of shafts, but then this, this pool of mysterious crystal water. As well, when you go to Luxor, you notice that it has this sudden angle. The upper area is the megalithic pre-dynastic. The lower area is dynastic. So between the pre-dynastic and dynastic times, that gives us evidence that the axis of the Earth suddenly shifted, because all the sites are anywhere are perfectly aligned to north, south, east, and west, but we find locations in Egypt 
where instead of east and west, they're off by 23 degrees. That's a shifting of the Earth. And I think all I'll have left with is a little bit more. Oh, well. This is Baalbek in Lebanon. It's called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. That's me and a friend. It weighs 1,200 tons. And all of a sudden, work stopped here. And we find that at many other locations. So it's a 1,200-ton stone still attached to the bedrock. And recently, some independent Russian researchers have been doing excavating just to the left-hand side, and they've uncovered a 1,600-ton stone, which I'll be seeing in April. So standard academia says the Romans built this, but what the Romans did is they built very roughly on top of a megalithic foundation. Here you see the Trilithon, which is three 1,000-ton stones. And then there are multiple of these 800-ton stones located at the actual uh, site of Baalbek, which is a mile from the quarry. And then again, inside, you see the 800-ton stones with the rough uh, construction by the Romans on top. And I guess I'll be allowed to do left is Petra. You all know this picture. This is 1% of Petra. Petra is seven miles long, or 12 kilometers. It took us eight hours to get from one end to another. And what you see are these massive chambers, like hundreds of them, cut into quartzite stone. So as you walk along, you see chamber after chamber after chamber. There are so many of them, they even turned two of them into bathrooms. And then this one, we can see the machining tool marks here at an angle. That's my wife. This is one of five chambers where 300,000 cubic feet of material was removed to make it. And when you get to the final end, again, look at the sense of scale of construction. This goes on for seven miles. And there are sister sites located um, at what's called Little Petra, and also this is in Saudi Arabia. And if you didn't know, under the Western Wall in Jerusalem, there's a stone block that weighs 500 to 600 tons, not done by the sons, of Israel, sons and daughters of Israel, maybe during the Canaanite period. Then there's lots of megalithic stuff in Greece and Italy and Japan and Easter Island. And I'm afraid that's all I have time. But ho I hope you're mildly overwhelmed by what you were able to see. Thank you. start to ask the question, it unfolds the fabric of space itself, how it's made, what is it made of? We're not alone in this universe. We never have been. Alien intelligences have cohabited with us on this planet for millions of years. We inherited the obsession from the Anunnaki. Anyone that still thinks that we're the ones that are obsessed with gold does not know enough about the true history of our species, how we came to be here, and the conditions that brought us here. We are not unique in this universe. Extraterrestrials do exist. We are, so to say, the copies of them.